Um, the um, Angolan Revolution, the, the Angola reached independence in 1975. Um, and at that time, there were three organizations. One was called the MPLA, the Movement for the, po the Popular Movement for the Liberation of Angola, the FNLA, and I'm going to get these names straight in a minute, <laughs> and um, UNITA. Um, and all three were, FNLA was operated pretty much in the north. You need to operate pretty much in the South, and the MPLA operated throughout the whole country. And at independence in November of 1975, South Africa invaded. Now at this time, most people wasn't sure which organization, which group that they supported. But in 1975, when the MPLA, which was the government, when Portugal, Angola was a Portuguese colony, when Portugal pulled out, um, MPLA formed a government. At that time, also, South Africa invaded from the south. Mm. Um, Zaire invaded from the north. With, Zaire invaded from the north along with FNLA troops. South Africa invaded from the south along with UNITA troops. So this made it clear for most people, you know, which was the true liberation movement. And the CIA poured a lot of funds into it, into um, Angola. The CIA went into Angola in July of 1975. We started out with six million dollars and eventually the total budget was 31 million dollars. The first effort was arms that were sent from America to Kinshasa in U.S. Air Force C-141 planes. And then from Kinshasa we hauled the arms into Angola in smaller airplanes. The total was uh, about 1,500 tons of arms, 30,000 rifles and small rockets and mortars. Our funds and arms were going to two of the three Angola factions. One of them headed up by Holden Roberto, who had had a relationship with us for about 15 years, and to Savimbi, who had not been well known by the CIA. He had the sole virtue of being in opposition to the MPLA, whom we were determined to oppose. President Mobutu of Zaire wanted this program. We bribed him. We gave him $2,750,000. CIA officers went in as advisors and trainers. They were called intelligence gatherers. But in fact, uh, they were preparing our allies for combat. I fled to San Salvador on January 16th. What did the enemy do in San Salvador? You mean what I saw? The Americans were there. How do you know they were Americans? When the villagers saw them with their own eyes, they saw they were Americans. There were 20 Americans. These Americans, what did they look like? Were they white? Were they black? Describe them. They were your color, comrade. They were not black. They had chestnut eyes. You know, whites. There were not enough CIA advisors to make a great deal of difference, however, and we hired European mercenaries, and we tried to hire white Angolan refugees to go back in as mercenaries fighting on our side. The CIA collaborated with the South Africans, and it was not officially ordered by the National Security Council, but there was liaison at all levels. The CIA was nervous about the role the Senate might play in this war. Senator Clark on the Foreign Relations Committee made a trip to Africa to review the situation, a fact trip to report to the Senate. The CIA watched him with some apprehension to see that he didn't get information we didn't want him to have. The Senate, led by Senator Clark, shut down the Angola program in December of 75. While the Senate was shutting us down, the uh, Cuban army eventually of 10 to 15,000 combat soldiers, made 21 aircraft, tanks, uh, just swept over the FNLA and UNITA. And we lost decisively. A victory that will change the course of African history. The victory of the heroic people of Angola.
Now, Cuba had a long history of support for African liberation. And I, I don't want to go into that. It might take a little too much time, but they supported in the Congo with Lumumba. They, 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 they worked with uh, different groups in, in just all over Africa in terms of African liberation. Che Guevara was uh, working with some African liberation exactly. movements. In fact, a lot of Cubans yeah. are black, that a lot of the Cubans yeah. originally were slaves who came over from Africa that to work on the Spanish uh, sugar uh, cane plantations. Yeah. So they have roots yeah. there. And they still the maintain the, the, the culture of the so-called mother country. Right. In, in and the interesting thing is, that w you know, I was reading one thing and it's really true. They said one of the most interesting paradoxes of history is that if the slave um, traders knew that that the people that they were taking over you know to cuba you, to cut sugarcane as slaves were going to come back centuries later and help liberate that territory they would just they wouldn't know what to do <laughs> and it's true you know but anyhow so they had they, they had the, the situation is that, that that the mpla government is backed up into the capital of luanda there's uh two major armies one coming from the south well, you know south africa put one of the the biggest tank brigades together since world war ii you know, to, to attack, and also from the north. Now, South Africa had, has still the most modern army on the shores of Africa. So, so of course, they felt like this was going to be a cakewalk, you know. Uh, they felt like that, that it was going to be just a few weeks that they were going to take Luanda, then they were going to back up and, and set up a united government. The MPLA government asked for help, sent out a call for help, and actually a lot of countries came to help. The major country was Cuba. They, 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 um, they discussed it. And they decided that if, if South Africa took Angola, that all of Africa would, be, would have to deal with apartheid. And, and, and it, it would destabilize more and more borders. So the African countries also supported Cuba coming. That's just an important point to make. So Cuba sent over about 40,000 troops or so to stop the South African invasion. They, um, the South Africans at this time were right outside of Luanda bef you know, before the Cubans could come. And they had done a tremendous amount of damage, you know, to the Angolan countryside, you know, moving all the way up. Cubans stopped them, and the Angolans stopped them. Another important point is that the, the MPLA army was a guerrilla army, which is totally, I don't know if, if your viewers um, are into tactics of war, but you don't hold land when you're trying to hold, try to hold land when you're a guerrilla army. It's a different technique, totally different strategy. Different. So they, they really didn't even know how to do to, to, to fight the South African Zaire right. and Unita and FNLA. Okay, so, so the Cuban army comes in, um, stops the attack, and pushes South Africa all the way back to the borders of Namibia. Which is pretty amazing, a small country like Cuba taking a giant like South Africa, which was supported by the CIA so, and the United States and pushing it back. Yeah, and pushed That's, Zaire troops hmm. back to, up to the north. And then the South Africans immediately uh, wanted to negotiate. And they wanted to negotiate because they knew that, that the force that had been put together could have went right into Namibia and liberated Namibia then. But, but, they, but they, they stopped at the Namibian border and negotiated. South Africa said that they would stay, there should be a de demilitarized zone on both sides of the, the Angolan border, in Namibia and in Angola, and that they would pull back. Of course, what happened was they didn't. They continually invaded. They continually invaded and kept in invading up till, you know, last year. So that, 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 that's the historical right. situation, and I can, if you want, talk about some of the current... Uh, well, that's what we're interested in. What's been going on in the last year or two to try to normalize Yeah, the, 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 uh, the South Africans are saying they want to negotiate again. I wouldn't trust them. Right, right. <laughs> um, right on both points. Um, the South Africans want to negotiate again. Mm -hmm. And, of course, people wonder why is that. I mean, mm -hmm. why all of a sudden the South Africans want peace in Angola and, in, in, and also are ready to... Um, uh, signed the UN resolution 435 giving independence to Namibia which it will sure put in a swap of government southwest west which Africa is a leftist government. government yeah and it's the government that they would have been trying to stop since they right. have been in uh, in Namibia well the, the, the point is this in November of uh, first of all South Africa has continually invaded and and there have been how how the defense of Angola has been over since 75 is they have built up three lines of defense, the uh, FNL, I mean the um, the FAPLA troops, which is the Angolan army. Three lines of defense, and then behind them the Cubans are. The, the Cubans um, sit back and have really have not really been in battle since 75, 76. Oh, really? Yes, um, the FAPLA troops, you know, are so good now that they have been able to stop 
South Africa. They, the South African troops have never been able to get to the third line of, of defense. They, the second line has always stopped the South African troops. But South Africa decided that the balance of forces were such that they wanted, because they were afraid that, that, that SWAPO was going to get independence from Namibia and a lot of things were happening around Africa. And they were, they were even destabilizing more countries more. Oh, Mozambique. They've been Mozambique. tearing Mozambique, bleeding Mozambique to death exactly. with their, their, been, their own countries. Right. Right, and they've been Lesotho, um, mm -hmm. you know, Swaziland, uh, Botswana. They've been going to all these countries, you know, at will. So they decided. They see. See, South Africa understands that that the most important country in Southern Africa right now is Angola, and they wanted to destabilize Angola more than any other country. So what they decided was they put their hopes on um, attacking a small town, which was the center of the MPLA military. It was called Quito Carnival, and they were going to move the Angolans out of Quito Carnival, put UNITA in, and... Um, Which is headed by Savimbi, yeah, the guy Savimbi. who's been to the United States well, a lot, and supported by the CIA. Yes. And South African connections. Okay. Yeah. CIA has, has been supporting Savimbi you know, since before 75. Right. Even though he says he's a Marxist, right. which is curious. But he <laughs> says, yeah. so says whatever, whoever he, who he's talking to, right. he says that's what he is. Right. He's a Christian, he's a Marxist, he's this. Right. He, he, you know, he's he an opportunist. A yeah. big opportunist, okay. Right. As a matter of fact, that, you know, one of the things that, that's really clear is the CIA and the United States government support UNITA through, with a lot of funds. And by supporting UNITA, they're supporting South Africa. We can't decide without asking South Africans. We can decide without asking uh, the, the Americans. A lot of the weapons that go to UNITA end up in South African hands. Anyhow, they wanted to, to, to take a, this, this town called Quito Carnival and make it a, a, a UNITA stronghold, and then UNITA was going to declare a government, you know, in, in, and, and, and then ask for South African help if they were attacked. So that was the plan. So it sounded like a very good plan. So they, the South Africans moved in across the river, Quito Carnival was on a river, and started bombarding and sieging Quito Carnival. And this happened in November. They, the siege was, went from November to March. November of 87 to March of 88, there, there was a siege. They attacked the city at least once a month, with major attacks coming in January, February, and March to try to break and, and push the MPLA out of Quito Carnival. The, the Angolans again asked the Cubans for assistance because they realized that this was the most uh, serious attempt at, at, at breaking their sovereignty at, you know, that has happened since 75. So they asked the Cubans for help. The Cubans talked about it and discussed it and decided that it was so important that they not take this town, that they not only, there were about 40,000 Cuban troops already in Angola, that, so that they not only um, wanted to move those Cuban troops into battle, but they sent 12,000 of their best troops of their, uh, that were in Cuba to Angola. This was a very complex undertaking, particularly from the logistics point of view. For this operation, the Cuban army will only take volunteers. Each person is interviewed to see if they have any personal objections to being a volunteer or if they have any home problems or psychological problems which would prevent them from volunteering. The term internacionalista is a very special one in Cuba. People who volunteer for overseas duty of any type, whether military or health workers or education, are called internacionalistas. The 
the equipment was also brought to the ports by rail. Este tipo de lucha frente a este tipo de the commanding general of the troops in Angola gives an orientation and welcoming speech. The general reconfirms the voluntary nature of the operation and asks if each of the soldiers is a volunteer. An advance contingent of troops is sent over by airplane. These are people from the Cuban Special Forces. The bulk of the troops and their equipment are sent by ship to Angola. The units of the special forces will be sent to the action area where the situation is most critical, at Quito Carnival itself. This is the area that the South Africans are attacking and it is about 1,000 kilometers from the airport in Luanda. Next is the South African attack. South African airplanes. And these are the Cubans defending Quito Carnival. These Cuban MiG airplanes in the hands of the Cuban pilots turned out to be decisively superior to those of the South Africans. The only airport in Angola was at Luanda. There were three ports, however, to receive the ships. The last two were in the southern part of the country, still about a thousand kilometers from the war zone itself. Transporting the men and materiel to this area was a Herculean task. The trek to the war zone begins. So, so now there's 52,000 you know Cuban troops in Angola. They so they said, and Fidel Castro actually said that the, because they sent these 12,000 troops, it called the the defenses of their own country into question. Mm. They, they had the their, they, 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 their their defenses weren't as good because they sent these 12,000 troops. It wasn't just the fact that the roads in this underdeveloped country were very primitive and very few. There were also losses and delays caused by mined roads, those mines which were laid by Savimbi's forces. And also a lot of bridges had been blown up by the guerrillas and by the South Africans. And added to all this was the fact that this was occurring during the spring floods, and so a lot of bridges were washed out as well as those which were demolished and blown up by the uh, guerrilla forces. Nonetheless, the Cubans did a, an amazing job of fording all of these areas, bypassing some areas, and where this was impossible, their engineers actually repaired and rebuilt the bridges themselves. Another monumental task of engineering and construction was building an airstrip which was close enough to the battle zone for close support tactical operations for the troops. Ahora, ustedes serán testigos de otra gran obra constructiva, hoy totalmente concluida. 
The construction was made well enough so that it could be used well into the future, not just for the immediate needs of the battle zone itself. By working around the clock, the Cubans completed the airstrip in only six weeks. The Cubans claimed that the South Africans were caught off guard and surprised by the short time it took for them to build the airstrip. The Cuban air power had a devastating effect on the South Africans. Meanwhile, back in Havana, Fidel Castro was examining every detail of what was going on. In this scene, he's talking to his supply officer, asking him where he's getting the food. They're buying Angolan tuna. And also wondering about why there are so many coals among the soldiers, suggesting that they should be sending more vitamin C to the troops. Castro also questioned very closely this tank commander who just came back from the battles. He suggests some changes in tactics. Meanwhile, some of the soldiers who have arrived at the war zone start preparing defensive positions. The troops received not only military briefing and information, but also a political indoctrination as to why they're there and what they're supposed to be doing. Meanwhile, the soldiers wait, prepare their positions with the help of some automated equipment which builds the trenches for them. They prepare their machinery and get ready for battle. The woman who is the head of the medical unit at the front says it's not only important to have medical facilities available, but also it's good for morale to have women there. These are the facilities which the Cubans have for medical assistance and treatment near the front. I guess equivalent to our MASH units in the Korean War. And here is what the patients would find in the city. Before going into battle, the Angola troops entertain the Cuban troops. From the end of January throughout February, the South Africans attacked, trying to break the lines of the Angolans, the Fapla troops, which were east of Quito Carnival. The heavy attacks by the South Africans caused severe losses to the Angola troops, which at one time in one significant sector only had eight tanks left to face the South Africans. But the Angolans held, particularly with the help of the fresh Cuban troops, 
This is vitally important because the main thrust of the Cuban attack was going to be to the west and to the south of the city to meet the South Africans at the Namibian border rather than passively receive the South African attacks and then counterattack. of heavy fighting from the end of January throughout February with South Africa attacking several times and the Cubans gradually pushing them toward the south. The Cubans particularly had the advantage in detective equipment such as radar sound detection and also in control of the air with the Cuban planes vastly outperforming those of the South Africans and driving them from the sky. Por estos días de febrero, los racistas habían cambiado la táctica. As a result of this, the South Africans changed their tactics. They could not make any day attacks anymore because they had no air superiority or a chance of surprise. So they started launching a series of night attacks. The South Africans still figured they had technological superiority, and so they attacked repeatedly in February. In one such attack, the South Africans began at four in the morning, attacking the FAPLA troops on the flank of the Cubans, trying to turn the flank and driving a wedge between them. But the attack was beaten off throughout this battle, which lasted more than 12 hours. Los combates de ese día se prolongaron por más de 12 horas. <laughs> the commander of the Cuban troops in Angola reviewed the situation the next day with his battle-weary troops. The strain of war can be seen in their steps and in their faces. Still believing they had superior equipment, the South Africans continued to attack into March. They did have excellent artillery, and that was causing the Cubans and the Angolans some problems. The South Africans thought that their tanks were superior to those of the Cubans, but this turned out not to be the case. As the lines held the Quito Carnival, the Cubans, Angolans, and Swapo troops pushed to the south, toward the Namibian border, and into that country. At the same time, they also uh, attacked South Africa on two other fronts. You know, Quito Carnival is more in the um, eastern part. In the western part, they also attacked. And, and the army consisted of FAPLA, which is a very good army now, of the Cuban troops, of SWAPO, the Liberation Organization in mm -hmm. Namibia, and the ANC, the Liberation Organization in South Africa. So actually what you had was a, a, a Liberation Army, 
of, of a number of countries, a number of liberation movements and countries um, coming together to defeat apartheid in South Africa. The leader of SWAPO, the Namibian resistance, had this to say in a speech. SWAPO and the, its military wing, the People's Liberation Army of Namibia plan, has created confidence in the masses of the Namibian people that they are self-liberators. So the struggle will be intensified until all the forces of fascism, colonialism, as represented in our country by the Bota regime, are wiped out and the seizure of power becomes a reality in Namibia. They push it all the way back to the Namibian border and again South Africa wanted to negotiate. But yeah. this time it was even a, it was more of a major defeat than last time. And the reason is that Cuba brought over and Angola had um, something called MiG-23s. These mm -hmm. are these jets that uh, South Africa, that, that the Soviet Union, you know, um, gave to Cuba. Well, actually, Cuba bought them, and and also Angola bought some. They were no the the, the MiGs, the the um, the Mirage jets that that South Africa bought from France were no match for these. Oh. The South Africa also has these really big tanks that they call elephants. These elephant tanks scare people because they're really big and they're really loud but they are no match for the smaller, more accurate Soviet tanks. So they were picking off tanks like that. If you got into a Soviet, I mean, a, a, a South African tank, that was like a death wish. Just like a, a Mirage jet, it was a death wish mm -hmm. because there was no way that you could, you could, you could, you could live. So, so they were knocking out all, this, all of South Africa's major weapon systems. What happened in this battle was that South Africa also attacked with what's called the Namibian Territorial Militia. That these are black troops mm -hmm. that South Africa was using as cannon fodder. These troops rebelled uh -huh. and refused to fight because they realized what the, what the deal was. So South Africa had to move up its white troops. And so what South Africa was began to, to have to, to deal with is a lot of white troops were getting killed. Their planes were getting knocked out of the sky. They couldn't even send up a plane. Um, their troops were getting beat really bad. So the white South Africans were getting killed by the, you know, you know, dozens or scores or whatever and um, so and, and the uh, interesting thing was that all of a sudden within South Africa a, a, um, a resistance movement get, began to develop for the draft people began to say I am not going into the army sounds like the United States in Vietnam where particularly black and Hispanic soldiers got mm -hmm. fed up you know fighting and dying over in uh, Vietnam American uh, jets were getting shot off by Vietnamese rifles, etc., <laughs> and so the war just couldn't continue. Right. And so it's the same thing going on right. in South Africa, right? Now. So, so on the one hand, you have, um, it, it, which is a very important point I'd like to make. You have South Africa in Namibia attacking Angola, and uh, South Africa has made Namibia the most militarized area, you know, along the border, the most militarized area in the world. There are more weapons, more guns, more tanks, more more missiles in, in the world right, in, in that northern part of Namibia. So, of course, they felt like they were going to um, just, just again, take this town and it would be very easy. But the important thing for your viewers to understand is that the balance of forces in Southern Africa have totally changed now. South Africa cannot go around with impunity and not expect to, to, to get, beat, get beat. In May of 1988, Fidel Castro addressed the special meeting of the non-aligned countries on the importance of Quito Carnival. But I may assure you something. La historia de África va a tener un momento muy importante. The history of Africa will have a very important moment. Antes de Quito con Navale. But when it is written, it will be written. Y otra después de Quito con Navale. Before Quito con Navale and Porque after Quito con Navale. Porque la poderosa Africa. Because the powerful South Africa. Los blancos, la raza white, superior. The superior race. Se estrellaron. Clashed contra un pedazo de territorio. Against a small piece of territory. Defendido por negros y mestizos. Defended by white and mulattoes. De, llamó mulato a todos los cubanos. We call all the Cubans mulatos. Desde de Angola and mulatos y del Caribe. From Angola and the Caribbean. Imagínense la gran potencia so poderosa que está. Diez años armando. Which has been uh, building up for ten years. Invencible, inteligente. Invincible, the intelligent power. Y que se haya estrellado. Which clashed. Contra un pedazo de territorio. Against aquí. a small piece of land. When you meet a white South African. Con un racista. A racist. Lo único que tienen que preguntarle the only thing you have to ask es qué is, pasó en Cuito Cuanavale. What happened in Cuito Cuanavale? ¿Qué pasó en Cuito Cuanavale? Eso es lo que hay que preguntarle. 
Mm -hmm. And there's a serious hope that there will be a, a negotiated settlement mm -hmm. to the uh, problems of uh, southern uh, Africa, and that South Africa will at least be put in its place for the time mm -hmm. being. Mm -hmm. And we'll just have to see if this is a ruse or if they're forced mm -hmm. into uh, scaling back on their operations. Yeah. Every time there's been a peace agreement or peace discussions with South Africa, South Africa has used it, it that, that, that discussion to move more troops mm -hmm. and to rearm. Mm -hmm. And like so what's fine. happening now is South Africa is trying to find a way to, uh, to rearm itself and get more modern weapons so they can go back into Angola. Everybody knows that. Mm. Everybody. And so what they're trying to do is use this Cuban troops issue mm -hmm. as a guise to do that. And, you know, the, the Angolans and the Cubans know what's happening because they've fought mm -hmm. South Africa before. Mm -hmm. But because of this major defeat, it, it, it causes a very big problem for South Africa. Because they're going to have to either negotiate or fight. Mm -hmm. And they can't win by fighting, so they're going to have to negotiate. Does South Africa want to negotiate? Why is it negotiate? that South Africa wants to negotiate? Sur Africa well, negotiate. South Africa wants to negotiate because, because it is fighting a very strong force as he had never uh, clashed before, as he had never en encountered parte. before, nowhere had it found such a force before. This is not the year 1975. In the year 1975, we had four, uh, 400 tanks, but we did not have the aviation. We did not have uh, anti-aircraft means practically hardly any. Now we have accumulated so many tanks around here. We have accumulated around here as many tanks more or less as South Africa has but they are better. We are not working to obtain a military victory. We don't want to have a military victory. It's enough if you, wa if you have to lose one life and any military glory really fades in the face of losing life because we feel responsible for the life of each and every of those men there. We are striving for a fair solution to the problem, a dignified solution to the problem which would guarantee the security of Angola and the independence of Namibia. And in exchange for that, with pleasure, in the period of time agreed, we will withdraw our troops. Then we have created the conditions so that a settlement can be reached. Of course, that entails risks, and we have been willing to run such risks. And a serious confrontation might occur. But we have to run such a risk, otherwise there wouldn't be a settlement. From Fidel Castro's opinions from May of 1988 and Kenneth Jones of December of 88, we turn to John Stockwell in February of 1989. John's book, In Search of Enemies, is primarily about Angola. South Africa is so-called getting out of Angola, but they did before, and then they came right back in again when there was, uh, it looked like there was going to be peace in the area. Now looks like the same thing happened. They had the, they're getting the Cubans to pull out. They got their ears pinned back. They pulled away. But now I understand that I heard where they've actually made some more armed attacks already. Angola. Three three weeks ago in London, in the interviews and discussions, this is very much what we were talking about. Was was uh, what is the guarantee that South Africa is going to respect this? The Cubans pull out. Uh, South Africa pulls out what's going to keep South Africa's violating every uh, international law and boundary in southern Africa what's going to keep them from going back into Angola how long will it be before they put their troops back in and the answer was two weeks yeah and now interestingly enough Washington's reaction on this of course Reagan had a a big aid program to Savimbi and uh, mm -hmm. Bush has promised to continue it and obviously is clearly doing so. Now, Savimbi's pinned down on the border down there now, uh, militarily, uh, and, and is a little better off than the Contras are, and he was taking a beating, so the South African forces came in to bail him out. The U.S. Uh, response, they, they obviously didn't stand up and say, well, we happen to be in there in force with the CIA and we call the South Africans in. Their, their, their statement was, I can just remember, you know, back in the task force, scribbling away the wording on the statement, you know, to put... When you were running the Angola yeah, operation. When we were running, uh, their, their answer was that it has not been confirmed uh, by any reliable sources that the South Africans <laughs> are, in fact, back in Angola. We they should, are. in fact, tell our audience that John Stockwell was the C 
CIA um, officer in charge of the Angola operation and resigned after that, wrote his book In Search of Enemies that began his process of developing a criticism of the CIA and has been speaking out as a peace activist um, ever since. So Angola has basically been a hot point for the whole Reagan administration. Well, let's strip uh, Angola down just yeah. real briefly while we're on the subject. Chester Crocker, Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, uh, was talking to some of us uh, in the Africanist uh, progressive side of things, Jerry Bender particularly at uh, the International School at USC, and promising that he was going to negotiate a settlement for Namibia and get the Cubans out of Angola. And uh, Jerry, whom I, a friend whom I respect enormously, said that, you know, if you succeed, we'll give you credit for it publicly. And Crocker succeeded. He pounded away and negotiated away, and it took six years, and eventually he worked out a deal where the South Africans would give Namibia its independence and the Cubans would go home. And the Cubans are going home, and it's a real deal. And the South Africans are, you know, there is uh, uh, at least some kind of a farcical uh, independence being uh, given to Namibia. Uh, the oversight, is it going to work? Are the UN forces going to cover it? Are death squads going to be left behind to keep a proxy control? You know, that question remains. But still, uh, Bender and, and I supporting him were obliged to say, yes, you know, Crocker, you did, you did it. Uh, Namibia finally is getting its independence. However, in that fascinating complex deal, the Cubans are coming home, South Africa is giving independence to Namibia uh, and, and getting out of Angola and promising to stay out even. Though. But the United States, although arbitrating that thing, did not promise to cease its aid to Savimbi to destabilize Angola. Now that is brass. But it's also like just idiotic. I mean, it just it sort of confirms your thesis in search of enemies that the role of the CIA is to search out enemies, to fight wars, to destabilize the world. Here's a region that needs stability. There's negotiations to try to uh, stabilize it, and the U.S. keeps supporting these rebel forces to try to overthrow the Angola government that led to the, all, the absolutely bizarre situation of the Cubans there that were supporting the Soviet-backed Angolan government protecting the U.S. multinational corporations. I think Gulf Oil had big... Gulf Oil, which was brought up by there, Chevron. That the Cubans were protecting yeah. against the CIA-backed Angolan rebel forces. So there's no, it's not even in U.S. economic interest when to Savimbi, destabilize Angola. When Savimbi was brought to Washington in the winter of 86, remember, he, he, uh, he, was, he, was, he dined at the White House, and yet he, w he went on television promising the aid that he was being given that he would attack Gulf oil facilities, which facilities had been built by loans which Reagan had approved. In addition to which, he has kept the central part of Angola frozen and the Benguela Railroad shut, and that's a Zaire, our big client's only economically viable egress to the sea, is that railroad that we pay Savimbi to keep shut. Meanwhile, uh, the human horror, the, the Red Cross counts 55,000 people in Angola who have been maimed by Savimbi's landmines wow. and attacks. And George Bush uh, continues to support those forces. Yeah. John, uh, wow. one of the analyses that I heard about the, the situation was that there was pressure within South Africa to get out. They wanted to get out of the Angolan situation. Uh, they didn't want to uh, support it financially and also there were problems because their soldiers were getting killed. So the United States said, okay, go ahead, pull out. We'll come in and we'll directly supervise the situation and take care of it. So it wasn't a big victory for the Angola government or for Cuba in that respect. It was just a switch of people who were going to control it. Well, this, yeah, this is exactly the point I was trying to make is that uh, us Crocker playing big arbitrator and we didn't agree to give the region peace. But it is a fact that Namibia is getting its independence. The, the, the South Africa is going to try to do what we did to Nicaragua in 1933 when we pulled the Marines out and created the guard and left it behind with Samosa, you know, in charge. They're trying to create the same type of a situation and have a proxy control of it. Uh, from the Cuban point of view, the Angolans are, are being left facing a dire situation with Savimbi still being funded to, to destabilize and the South Africans still coming across the border and the Cubans coming home. 
and uh, in Cuba's uh, interests, and and it's it's very difficult to fault them because they've. Uh, they, they've sacrificed a lot of their own and their own capital to the extent that they can, and they're not a wealthy country uh, to, to stick up for their allies, the Angolans. But this is the point at which they could, in fact, come home with uh, uh, having accomplished, uh, you know, a measurable objective. But it's Namibia is independent because of what they did. Yet the independence of Namibia or any country in Africa is precarious because of the CIA presence there. Whenever an independent African nation takes a socialist road or a road that goes against the interests or ideologies of the CIA, they destabilize the government. Kwame Nkrumah wrote a book called Class Struggles in Africa that documented the ways that the CIA overthrew about 25 progressive governments in Africa, including Nkrumah's own uh, Gandhian government in the 1960s. So if Namibia takes a route that the CIA doesn't like, they can act to destabilize it one way or the other. So that's really the precarious situation that all independent nations in Africa face. This is one of Chomsky's best points, is that uh, when the U.S., when a country tries to escape, our first effort is to bludgeon them back into the fold. And if that fails, uh, as it did in Cuba, conspicuously, as it did in Vietnam, conspicuously, as it's done in Angola to date, and Nicaragua to date, then the fallback is to starve them out create economic chaos so that they will not be a positive example to anyone else to want to break free. We don't want to have a military victory. It's enough if you, if you have to lose one life and any military glory really fades in the face of losing lives because we feel responsible for the life of each and every of those men there. We are striving for a fair solution to the problem, a dignified solution to the problem which would guarantee the security of Angola and the independence of Namibia. And in exchange for that, with pleasure, in the period of time agreed, we will withdraw our troops. Then we have created the conditions so that a settlement can be reached. Of course, that entails risks, and we have been willing to run such risks. And a serious confrontation might occur. But we have to run such a risk, otherwise there wouldn't be a settlement. But we are not looking for a confrontation to obtain an important military victory. We rather want a solution. A solution to part of the problem of Southern Africa, because perhaps if this political solution is attained, we will be able, and if the independence of Namibia is attained, I think that then the time will get closer when South Africa would have to discuss with the ANC, and when South Africa would have to discuss the problems of apartheid. After this, in the present conditions of the world, in an atmosphere of detente, peace, disarmament, South Africa will have no other choice than to discuss with the ANC. I think that if such a settlement is attained, the time will have come to demand from South Africa to discuss with the ANC the settlement of uh, the problem of apartheid. Of course, South Africa knows that it is in a situation of danger because all those forces, they had never had to face such an important force. And South Africa is very calculating, cynical, opportunistic. If they can do something and get away si with it, they try to do it. If they could go into Mozambique, si they would do it. Zambia, if they can go into Zambia, they do it. Crime. To do anything, to si commit crimes. En, en Lesotho, if it can go into Lesotho, si puede, en Bojuana, if it can go into Botswana, wherever South Africa can go, it goes. Donde no tiene baja, where it doesn't donde suffer impune, casualties, where they can do away with it, pero no tiene que where they can get away with it. But now, when they have to face such an important si force as the concentration of Cuban and Golan forces there, now they think it twice. They try to calculate the risks and they are careful, they are watchful, and that's real reality. There. And they know they are, that they are in the face of a risk. And it will be up to them what happens here. If they, re if they react with a haughtiness, 
And if they want a confrontation, puede ser que pierdan no solo Namibia. It could happen that they lose not only puede Namibia. Puede ser que pierdan el apartheid. It could happen that they even lose apartheid. Si, si Sudáfrica se si adhiere a una catástrofe a una catástrofe militar, puede ser el fin del apartheid. That could even be the end of apartheid. Porque ese régimen es demasiado débil. Because that regime is too weak. Demasiado in débil políticamente. Too weak politically. Y tiene demasiado gente oprimida allí. And that keeps too many people oppressed. Y no se puede arriesgar a una derrota and that regime militar. Grande. No se puede arriesgar una catástrofe militar. Nosotros lo sabemos, pero no, 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 no queremos. No queremos una victoria militar. Queremos que este problema se resuelva ahora. Y creo que estaríamos en la antesala de la solución del problema del apartheid. Creo que uno de los grandes problemas que le quedan no solo al África, sino al mundo. But even if the South Africans and the Cubans all leave Angola, that still leaves Savimbi free in the country, still supported by the United States. John Stockwell tells us more about Savimbi. Uh, South Africa's policy is to keep Angola destabilized. They've kept their armies in southern Angola for about 10 years since the 75 thing. Uh, they've costed billions of dollars in damages. They raid and bomb throughout, you know, up into the central part of the country uh, with the purpose of, you know, of just keeping the country off balance and keeping it at war and keeping it from being able to spend its money to build schools and hospitals. And they've supported Savimbi because he can, he can work with his guerrilla forces and go in and raid and blow things up deep into the country. So they've armed him and fed him and kept him viable. Well, superficially, you know, this is very appealing. Uh, this guy is uh, macho plus. He is very charismatic. He's a beautiful guy. He's fun. He's, he's got these kind of wide popping eyes and this energy, you know. And he's, he's got a quality which uh, very few of these liberation leaders have, which is he likes to fight. He likes to be in the bush with his men. And, and you know, everywhere else in the world, the trouble like the Contra commanders, they want to be in Tegucigalpa or in Miami. And uh, they don't want to go in there and die in the hills of northern Nicaragua. They want to get in, Maya in Managua and drive the Mercedes. But Savimbi wants to be in there with his men, directing the things. And you know him well. You, you spent yeah. time with him, I guess, didn't you? Whenever? I went into his lair and uh, recruited him into our program and then indirectly managed the liaison with him. Uh, that charisma and his, light, you know, his, his, his yin for the, the, the contest and he's fighting communists, a Marxist government. And man, that's simple. We have to support him. We have a moral obligation to support him. Wow, let's give him some money. Now, it gets a little bit more wrinkledy when you add in the fact that Savimbi is an avowed Marxist. <laughs> so, I didn't know that. Oh, he was yeah. a Maoist. He was fighting <laughs> oh, yeah. the uh, Portuguese uh, colonialists under yeah. a Marxist-Maoist uh, banner. In the last year, uh, we've, we've had Savimbi going on television and telling about his plans if he ever gets into power to reorganize the country along Mar Marxist lines. Now, what we're doing, and we've given him the first $15 million to Savimbi, and we've got trainers in there with him right now uh, to, to train him in his terrorist activities. And this is the man we would go in and work with. Now, the congressmen and senators that I was talking to would say, well, what are our alternatives? And uh, I was saying that's easy. We, es we establish relations with the government of Angola, which is what Gulf and Rockefeller and everybody have been saying all along, to provide the diplomatic umbrella and influence for our corporations that are doing great business there right now. And then we order South Africa to get her troops out of the country because they have a policy of destabilizing this country. And, of course, we shut off aid to Savimbi and hopefully starve him out so that he has a choice of working peacefully, politically in the country, which may be impossible now because there's so much bloodshed, but it was possible originally. Or he can go live somewhere else and, and play some other game. John, what is the response of the rest of the world toward Angola? You know, what is it, 97 percent of the world condemns this. It's we're on the wrong side. For us to be holding hands with and working with uh, South Africa and the brutalization of a black African country is uh, criminal and just totally impolitic.